Okay. Hola, buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos al webinar de esta tarde. Se titula Value Investing y Small Caps, la experiencia europea de Amiral Gestión. En este webinar de Amiral de la mano de Rafael Moreo, nos explicará cómo aplican el Value Investing dentro del nicho de las Small Caps, que son compañías que se alejan del radar de muchos inversores y que presentan un gran potencial. Eh, y también nos presentará su visión de mercado, ¿vale? eh, comentando las qué compañías han incorporado recientemente en las carteras y qué consejos puede dar para los inversores que apuesten por este tipo de compañías. Rafael Morao es licenciado en, en finanzas empresariales por ESEC, donde se graduó en 2007. Tras trabajar como analista financiero en UBS y Keylon, se incorporó en Armiral en el año 2008. En la actualidad es eh, gestor coordinador del Sextan PME y cogestor del Sextan PA. Eh, bueno, el webinar, como sabéis, se impartirá en inglés, pero podéis eh, hacer las preguntas tanto en inglés como en, como en español. Os invito a que aprovechéis la oportunidad de que tenemos un gestor de reconocido prestigio con nosotros para hacer todas las preguntas que consideréis. Eh, well, Rafael, when, when you want. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Samuel. Hello, everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, so the purpose. Uh, of this presentation is both to talk about our investment philosophy, uh, to, go, to talk about our investment process, and to, uh, to illustrate also this uh, with a few, uh, with a few uh, examples uh, currently or from the past. Uh, so basically, um, yeah, that's, um, well, what is value investing for Amiral Gestion? Uh, You know, obviously, there are two main styles uh, in value investing. You have the cigar butt approach from Benjamin Graham and uh, uh, the big moat approach uh, uh, that currently Warren Buffett is, is practicing. Um, many investors, they go from, they start from uh, the first approach and uh, over time in their careers, they, they switch to the second one. Uh, we, we, are not, uh, we are not exceptions. Uh, however, we have not... Uh, Uh, decided to go for one or the other. Uh, in the end, uh, one style or the other can uh, can work well in a given period of time uh, and less in another. Um, uh, over time, we you know we've, we've we've practiced this uh, since 2002. So that's the chart of our uh, historical fund, Sextant uh, PEA. Um, so uh, as you can see, it's been up uh, more than tenfold since inception in 2002. Uh, so that uh, represents a 15.3% uh, uh, Kager um, uh, since uh, since the beginning. Uh, I, I think this debate of uh, uh, cigar butts versus uh, uh, high quality companies at uh, at a higher price or at a fair price um, is not a, a. I mean, it's an important debate, but I think. The, the critical thing is to be able to know what you are buying exactly. The risk is to is to buy something at low quality without really being properly of, aware uh, of what uh, of what you are you are buying. Uh, so that's why in 2010, and uh, we learned uh, you know lessons obviously from the 2008 crisis, we developed uh, a tool internally you know that is uh, in, in the end uh, kind of checklist that is a quality grade. Where we assess the businesses not on, you know, we just set apart the valuation and we look at the businesses purely on their quality aspects. Uh, in the end, it's to be able to 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 track uh, to track the quality and then compare it with the valuation, uh, which is uh, the best tool we have to avoid uh, some some costly uh, mistakes. Um, this small cap universe in Europe is very large. We have an, uh, we have identified. 1,800 uh, companies in this field. You can see that uh, the big pools of small caps are in the UK, in Scandinavia, in France and Germany, uh, also Eastern Europe, like Poland, that has a lot of lots of IDs. Uh, and the you know the aggregated market cap of this segment is, is very large. In any case, it's a very heterogeneous. You have all kinds of sectors and many types of geographies and and qualities of companies as well. Uh, here we are looking at the relative performance of small caps versus large caps, so uh, just looking at the markets. Uh, we took the, uh, 
uh, both the, the European small cap indices in, in uh, light blue and uh, the large cap, I mean, in Europe and France, and the same in, uh, for the large caps in uh, 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 dark blue and, and red uh, at the French and European level. And what you can see is that both in Europe and France and any type of uh, any given area, the small caps in the long run have significantly outperformed uh, the large caps. Uh, I think the main reason for this is that some small caps, obviously for small caps, it's easier to grow, you know, tenfold, twentyfold, thirtyfold, and even more in the long time horizon, which is much tougher for uh, for large caps, obviously. Uh, uh, and the, as those companies grow, they become a bigger and bigger weight of their indices, and they they drive the small cap indices higher. Okay. Uh, I think that's the main reason, because you, obviously it doesn't mean you need to invest only in small caps, uh, because there are great great performances and, and great ideas in large caps, but the fact that those small companies can grow 20, 20 30 times uh, helps uh, this segment uh, significantly. Okay, uh, then on this slide, it's a bit uh, the corollary of what I just said, is that uh, you have the best performances in the small cap segment, but you also have the worst performances. Uh, that's for the data we had done for 2016, so it's not the freshest news, the freshest data we have, but you know, it should be very equivalent last year or so. We just looked at the, at the French large cap index on the right side and the French small cap index on the left side. If you look at the first quartile, so the, the ideas that performed the best in the CAC 40, so the, the big, big caps, on average, or the median made 25%, was up 25% in this first quartile. Huh? So, so the top 10 IDs, if you just took the fifth best ID in the end, it was up 25%. If you look at the fourth quartile, so the, the ones that performed the last, uh, it was down 10%. So that's a gap between the first quartile and the fourth quartile of 35%. If you look at the CAC mid and small, so the small caps, the first quartile was up 45% and the fourth quartile was down 26%, okay? So you have, you here you have a 71% gap between the first quartile and the fourth quartile. So it means that you cannot, you cannot just buy any type of small cap, obviously, and hope to do, to do the best, even if the segment as a whole, on average, in the long run, has a good performance. It's really an area where, you know, it's necessary to do your own research, to have experts or specialists doing at their fundamental analysis uh, and, and try to, to pick, uh, to pick, to pick the, the, best, uh, uh, the best ideas. Okay, uh, that, that's what we've done at Amiral since the beginning. Uh, we have uh, deliberately uh, wanted uh, forever to have a large team. Uh, today, the Amiral Gestion is 40 people, uh, you know, three offices in Paris, Madrid, and Singapore. Uh, but out, out of those 40 people, you have 25 investment professionals uh, who really dedicate most of their time to analyzing securities. Uh, and we like to look at areas that are uh, not known by markets or, or by many investors. Uh, uh, so small caps are obviously a good hunting ground for that, uh, but also companies that just don't want to talk to investors or basically stories or companies where you really need to, uh, to do the extra mile in terms of research, and that's where you find the hidden gems. So to illustrate a little bit uh, what I'm saying, uh, I think a good way is to just look at the composition of our small cap fund, which is, so it's a pure small cap fund, Sextant PME. Um, uh, if you look at the composition of, of its holdings, you have 47%, so the of the portfolio that is covered by zero or just by one sell side analyst. Okay, so almost half of the portfolio is almost not covered by any sell side analyst, uh, uh, and and even two analysts is not very well covered. Obviously, when you look at some uh, uh, you know big caps that are covered by uh, 30 different uh, analysts. So here. We are we are we are invested in companies that are not very well known by 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 uh, other investors because sell side houses are not uh, 
sharing the stories and analyzing the figures and 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 giving them to everybody you know just a, a couple of hours after the press release here we are uh, talking uh, about companies that you know they might publish their publish their results and the market might not react simply because it has it has not realized that the company has published results you know so and also you know uh, uh, sometimes you can uh, you can be in advance if you know your your stocks very well. You can be in advance compared to uh, the majority of other participants just by having an in-house uh, proprietary uh, research. Okay. Uh, investing in small caps has some specificities. Uh, first, the liquidity constraints. You know, it's difficult to get in and out, so it's not very easy to trade those markets. Uh, so an, a long-term investment philosophy is really needed uh, to be able to outperform in the long run. Um, information is, you know, less available than on larger caps. So uh, you don't, you don't, uh, we don't really use, for example, consensus figures or or, or sell-side uh, research, as you as you, as you understood. Uh, we prefer when it doesn't exist uh, because it uh, it makes inefficiencies higher. Uh, so we have our own models on all our, our, all our companies uh, and our valuation. And management, I mean, the quality of the management team is also a key factor because one given person has a much uh, a bigger impact in a, in a small company rather, you know, than in a, a large company that has a lot of processes and structure. Uh, uh, so that's why it's very important to, to understand also uh, the philosophy of the the CEO running uh, running the show. Okay. Uh, then our investment process. Um, uh, we generate ideas, you know, by many different ways. First, you know, we meet lots and lots of companies. Uh, it's very difficult to know exactly how many companies the team meet uh, in a given year. But personally, uh, I meet something like 400 companies uh, every year, uh, all over Europe. Uh, so that's lots of occasions uh, where you can find uh, interesting uh, opportunities, obviously. Uh, we do all kinds of uh, screenings, both on uh, you know, external screenings and also internally. Uh, we have a, a very large base with, a very, I mean, with many financial models. And, and, and also another way to, to find uh, ideas is you know, very often when you we analyze one company, we look at the whole value chain. So uh, talk to uh, competitors, to customers, to also to, to providers of equipment uh, that can also be themselves interesting to invest in. And we talk, uh, we network with uh, many international value investors uh, all over all over the world who have a similar investment philosophy. Um, then we have the quantitative uh, quantitative model, not rocket science. Uh, you know, we learn. You know, you learn it at school basically. Uh, uh, however, uh, you know you have you must have the discipline uh, to go through this step. Uh, so every every uh, investment that we do has a, a very uh, detailed quantitative model, uh, mostly about the past, the, you know the history of the uh, financial statements, where you learn a lot about the behavior of the business and the management. Um, and then we have this qualitative checklist that I talked about, uh, where the business is assessed on 24 different criteria. Uh, and that's the analysis part that is obviously never finished. You always learn and, 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 and refine your quantitative model and also refine your understanding of the strengths of the business, so it's never finished. Uh, but once the fund manager has an idea, his obligation uh, be, is to um, is to present this ID to the rest of the team. Okay, so it's basically an email that sums up the investment case. Then the uh, the, the 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 investment case is debated in the management meeting, that is a weekly meeting. Um, and then you know this ID is debated, criticized. Um, some people might bring their own experience on this company or. Or the sector, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and then any given fund manager in his sub portfolio, because we have a sub portfolio approach where every fund manager has flexibility to invest in his own IDs, um, uh, he's free to, to buy the ID even if the others are not very favorable for it. And the purpose is really to give lots of autonomy, 
responsibility to every fund manager. Uh, and it's also because it's in the ideas that are not easily, where everybody is not easily convinced, you know, immediately where you, you find the best ideas. So we don't, we want people to have this freedom and, 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 and just after try to convince the other fund managers to buy it. Okay. We can talk about it if you want in the questions. Then, I, because I, I want to, to spend some time on, on the examples, which, which might illustrate uh, very well uh, what, uh, what we just explained. So I will talk about three, three examples, um, Montupé, Picanol, and Follis. Um, Montupé is a French company that is not anymore in the portfolio uh, that we sold a couple of years ago. Uh, Picanol and Follis are still in the portfolio. We bought them several years ago already. Uh, Picanol uh, is a Belgian company and Folis is a Greek company. So Montupé, Montupé it was a, a, a French auto parts maker uh, producing cylinder heads for those who like uh, uh, the automobile industry. Um, it was a company that, I mean, basically the whole auto parts maker sector in France was very cheap back in 2013. You know, I came up with this... Uh, with the idea, I mean, I started with Montupé, but you know, in the end, all all uh, the competitors were also great uh, opportunities. Uh, just looking at multiples, uh, which were very low, uh, we were talking about P multiples below five, clearly below five. Um, and I had just noticed that this uh, company had uh, a bit margins that were eight percent. I mean, had been eight percent for a couple of years in 2011, 12, 13, while before the crisis, so even in the good years in 2005, 6, 7, it was doing only 2%. So you had the, the uh, automobile uh, sector that was still uh, in recovery mode, uh, still low levels, but this company was making much higher profits than before the crisis. So I did my due diligence, you know, obviously it was a stock that was not covered, uh, worked on the figures, uh, you know, started presenting the company to 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 my to my fellow uh, team members, and, and I, it was very funny because many uh, many people, and especially the older ones who had the highest experience, uh, they were not very uh, seducted, let's say, by this idea. Some of them were clearly against uh, because it had been a horrible sector to invest in for like 15 years. Uh, it was a, you know, by it had the notoriety of a sector that had just been horrible for a long time, when all those auto parts makers were just the slaves of their clients, who were very often Peugeot and Renault for the French uh, part. Um, and, you know, many companies had gone bankrupt. I mean, it had just been a nightmare sector to 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 invest in. However, I, you know, I, I suggested, you know, just which maybe we should have a fresh look at this sector because. Margins are very different compared to what they were before, and you know, obviously the management reputation had been very poor in the past, and so many people just didn't want to look because um, because so much pain had been uh, had been felt in the past on on this uh, on this company and and this and this sector. Actually, this the, the, just presenting this uh, this idea and the feedback I got, you know, rather than uh, you know uh, rather than uh, despairing me, it gave me more energy because I just understood that the whole market was thinking the same. And for me, it was the explanation for this very low valuation in the market. So I, I continued my due diligence and, and we do those, you know, some expert calls where we, we pay, we, we buy the services of, of a company to find, a, find us experts on a given subject. And I talked to a, a, a buyer uh, working at General Motors in Detroit who was purchasing um, uh, the cylinder head made by Montupé. And, and I, I remember very well this call. I, after 10 minutes, you know, this American guy was so positive about this company that I asked him, you know, can you spell, please, the name of the company you're talking about? Because the gap between the reputation in the markets and what he was telling me, uh, you know, as a professional of the industry was so wide that I, I just felt something was wrong. But it was really, you know, it, it was really the same company we were talking about, and they basically explained me that that during the the the, the, 
these very difficult years of 2008, 2009, uh, the US and also Europe, they voted for a very stringent CO2 emission regulations uh, that was forcing automakers to reduce their CO2 emissions and oil consumption, et cetera, et cetera. And in, especially in the US, it, it was the first time that we had very strong uh, regulation on, on, uh, on emissions in the car industry. Uh, and so the, the, the US players who were, you, you know, had, were, were used to use uh, either American or Mexican auto parts makers, they had to turn to you know, European technology to respect uh, these regulations. And that's, that's when they invited, you know, Comotupe and other companies in the sector to come in the U.S. And, and the, the, the technology gap was so different compared to what they were used to that it was great for, for, for them. Also, some competitors had gone bankrupt during the crisis. And so uh, competition was, was lower than, than previously. Obviously, nobody was explaining this to me you know, uh, the, I, I, there was no um, set-aside research explaining all what I just said. We had to find it progressively, you know, and to 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 build an investment case to to understand what's going on in in the industry with, you know, obviously all the dots uh, that can be linked to it. Uh, but in the end, Montrepe, we we started to buy it at eight euros. At eight euros, uh, we continued buying upwards. Uh, we finished actually selling it at fifty-seven. And it was taken over a few months later at 73. Uh, so it was a very, very uh, positive example of uh, illustrating our process and especially the sub portfolio approach. Uh, because if we had had to have a consensus to invest in this one at the beginning, um, we would probably would never have done the work on, the, on it because it was so contrarian as a sector. Uh, that that uh, it would have been very tricky to involve, you know, all the time that was necessary to to understand fully the investment case. Then Picanol. So Picanol, it's a, it's a Belgian company. It's a world leader of weaving machines. So it transforms thread huh, into fabric. Uh, those, the, so the machines are sold to you know all over the world, but it's especially in the textile industry geographies, so like China. Like, India, Bangladesh, etc. Um, and Picanol, we bought it, uh, you know, similarly in 2013. It's, it's still one uh, of the top positions in uh, in our uh, small cap fund. At the time, it was just a, a, a low P stock. Um, the company had a very significant cash, net cash position, um, and uh, and valuation was low. Uh, but it was a company that um, we actually we never managed to talk to them. Uh, so we've been invested for five years now, uh, but we never managed to talk to the management. Uh, they don't want they don't want to lose time talking with minority shareholders and prefer to focus on, on their business. Uh, but uh, we, we tend to like it generally, but they are obviously a bit extreme regarding this. Um, but still, at the time, the, the, the valuation was low. Uh, the balance sheet was very strong. Um, no. What we wanted to understand was the market position. So we, thought, we did again an expert call, uh, actually a couple of them. We talked to former employees, uh, to clients, etc. And, and we basically understood that this company was, you know, the leader in its sector, really the benchmark in terms of market share and also in terms of, of technology, that it was well managed. Uh, and the other thing we wanted to, to check at the time was the 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 positioning in the cycle. Were we at the top of a cycle or were we at the re beginning of a recovery? Uh, it was very reassuring at the time. So, uh, you know, given the valuation that was very low, probably a PE of five only again, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we, we built a significant position. Then over time, you know, stock price went higher so the higher the stock price, uh, you know, to keep the investment in in your portfolio, you you must uh, have a stronger convic conviction, obviously, yeah, because the higher the stock price, the higher the risk. Um, and there was this, um, you know, every four years, the textile industry has uh, an, a, a big event called ITMA, um, uh, where you know it's a big fair. It was happening in Milan this time in November 15. 
actually in 2019 it will be in Barcelona uh, so we'll be there <laughs> this occasion uh, so we traveled to Milan um, and we met with everybody was was relevant in this industry we met with uh, commercial people of Picano. Uh they were more much more talkative than their CEOs uh, as we spent like one hour and a half with the commercial guys who explained us everything about the company you know told us many interesting stories about what had been going on uh, in the past in the company how they had uh, escaped and the 2009 crisis which had been tough for them um, uh, then we talked to the to the competitors so uh, two Japanese companies and one Italian, basically, and they all explained to us that Picano was really, you know, top notch in terms of technology, and it was the company they wanted to look like, um, to look like too. But uh, clearly, they were strongly in advance in terms of technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, you know, it, it it just fueled our conviction on the case. Now that you know, we we had bought at 25 euros in 2013. And now we are at uh, close to 100 euros, but it's still a top position. Uh, so what has happened? Because you know, obviously, I, I don't think that at the time we bought, we, we had a 300% of site potential. But it's just that this company, first, they have ex outperformed our expectations in terms of growth and in terms of profitability by a wide margin. So we were quite conservative uh, in terms of our expectations. We didn't need we didn't need much. Uh, to, to have a strong investment case, but they clearly outperformed uh, those assumptions. Uh, and also, they have been very strong at capital allocation, uh, meaning that they have used their cash very smartly. They have acquired um, a, a stake, a significant stake, in another Belgian company called Tessandalo. Um, it's a chemical company. At the beginning, we didn't like it very much because uh, it was a diversification that had nothing to do with uh, with um, with the textile industry. However, we have to recognize that they have acquired a great business uh, and they are applying the same principles that they've done at Picanol uh, and investing in the business uh, very significantly. Uh, uh, and the, the, their stake in Tessandolo, which is a, a listed company, has, has doubled you know, in terms of market value since they, since they acquired. So they, they have created value this way also. Uh, so now, when you, you know, just you look at the current situation, you know, uh, if you deduct the uh, if you deduct the um, the stake they have in Tesla law that they don't consolidate because they don't have majority, uh, you have a stock you know a stock uh, an equity that is uh, trading below you know at about six times PE multiples ex cash. So it's still very cheap. It's still very unknown. Uh, not many brokers cover it, and even those who cover it, they don't have a lot of information. Uh, and that's why it's still a, a great business that is completely undervalued. And then the final one is Follis, uh, which is a very different situation, actually. Uh, it's a, typically a stock that we acquired with a high P, uh, and it did not prevent us from uh, doing a great performance so far. Follis, as I said, it's a Greek company. Um, it's the franchisee of IKEA in Greece, um, but also in Romania, Bulgaria, Cyprus, uh, etc. And for this, we, we bought it in at the end of 2015. Um, if you remember, in the summer of 15, you had this big, you know, the, the Brexit referendum. Uh, you had capital controls for three weeks, so you. I mean, you had the stock market was closed for three weeks, and, and in the context of capital controls, uh, and and so we started looking at the Greek market at this time because nobody wanted to invest there, and that's also where you can find some opportunities. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, what what's the situation? Basically, um, they operate in a market, uh, the furniture market in Greece, that has just been a nightmare. Uh, it has collapsed by 75% since the top, okay? Uh, so you just have to imagine that the whole market has just, you know, evaporated. Uh, but they have been able to gain market share in this period. So since 2010, their market share has gone from 13 to 23% of the market. So it does mean that the model, the model is strong, uh, it's relevant, 
uh, it's relevant uh, because obviously it's rather cheap product. Uh, also, uh, some part of the competition was, uh, let's say, a little bit in the black economy, not paying VAT, etc., etc. Uh, so with the Troika implementing reforms, some of them are just getting out uh, of the market. Um, also, uh, some players have had trouble just to import the products because nobody wanted to, to do business with a, a weak player in Greece. You know, the Chinese didn't want to sell to the Greek, basically. Uh, so Fullis, as part of, you know, uh, helped by the IKEA group, they got facilities to, to have their stores filled with products, basically. So, so really, it's, it's typically a situation when, when you have a market leader or a strong player, he's in the long run helped by the crisis uh, because it reinforces their competitive advantages. We bought this stock at 2.4 euros uh, in, at the end of 15, as I said, and, and now it's at 6 euros. Uh, but the market still has not recovered in Greece. The other areas that are present, they are still in a good trend, like uh, double-digit growth. But the Greek market is still at rock bottom, and, and we do feel that it will recover, because if it's, even if you don't expect a recovery in GDP, you know the, the furniture market, as a percentage of GDP, is at only 0.4%, uh, yeah? while in a normal country, the furniture market is roughly 1%. So if you just assume some kind of you know, in, increase in consumption in Greece, just a, a return to normality, let's say, uh, you have strong upside. And, and it's typically a business with high fixed costs when increases in, uh, in sales will drive, uh, will drive earnings significantly. So very easily, if you just assume some growth in the business, and I'm not even talking about 10% per year, in a couple of years, you could be with a stock that is, you know, at current levels, you, 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 would, uh, you would be at uh, 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 like six times, seven times P uh, with a, a balance sheet that would have almost no debt. So uh, it's typically a great company in a, in a bad zip code. So a great company in a bad place, uh, but when the context will improve, uh, in uh, in Greece, they should benefit strongly, uh, and the, you know we've met now. The, we've traveled to Greece many times. You know, visited their stores, you know, discussed with the management at you know very high levels, uh, and, and we feel they are uh, really really benef you know prone to uh, to succeed when the market is a bit better. So that's it for the examples I wanted to talk about. Uh, so now, maybe if you if you have questions, uh, I'll be happy to uh, to answer them. It can be you know on the philosophy, on the process, or or on the ideas, on or, or whatever whatever you want. Um, it would be a pleasure. Okay, so we have some questions. The first of all is about a macroeconomic point of view. Uh, to which trends in markets should investors pay more attention? in the economy the, the coming years and how can the trade war between US and China affect the portfolio of the Amiral? All right, so um, I will disappoint you because we are clearly not macro experts. Uh, Macroeconomy is something that we first try to understand, which is uh, already very star very tough. And, and for sure, we don't make any, any bets uh, any bets on, on uh, macroeconomy. Uh, um, we, it's just a matter of assumption in the end. Risk are, risks are all everywhere and all the time. Uh, and when one risk disappears, another appears. So currently the risk, you know, the current risk is the U.S. trade war with China or U.S. productionism uh, more globally. We also have the Italian crisis. You know, tomorrow there. You know, today there. You know, Spain politics are also quite complicated to read. But tomorrow it will be. It will be something else. Uh, and, and we always have to be ready for for some risk to be a worry, and sometimes the risk will become, you know, tangible, uh, very tangible. Um, I think it's 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 safe to say that we have to uh, we have to. Uh, recognize that the growth, uh, the world growth, and especially the 
um, mature market growth will continue to disappoint uh, to disappoint in the long run. Uh, that's our base assumption uh, because of the demographics uh, that is quite uh, structural, because of the debt levels of many countries, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know the U.S. Uh, has decided to. Uh, lower the taxes, it has benefits in the short term, but the sustainability of the U.S. budget is just a big question mark for us. Um, so it boosts the market in the short run, obviously, because everybody lowers the tax rate in their models and just thinks things are cheaper. But how sustainable are those low taxes at some point? The, uh, uh, the inequalities also in the you know in the developed world uh, which are getting higher and higher and are also risks because it can uh, trigger populism uh, at any in any kind of country so i know i'm not replying uh, directly to your to your question uh, i just think we we have to uh, to incorporate uh, to incorporate those risks in any type of of uh, uh, investment case in the end what matters is inflation could be a significant risk. Also, you know, uh, not many people involved in the uh, asset management industry today have experienced uh, strong inflation episodes. Uh, uh, in the in the eighties in Europe, uh, we had you know inflation uh, rates of fifteen percent. Uh, uh, and if you if we were to go to such an environment uh, it would be it would be impacting the uh, valuations uh, significantly i think what matters in the end is is uh what is the value added that the company is bringing uh to 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 its clients and to the society in general uh if a company is providing a good service and people really are just you know cannot avoid using this service they will pay for it this company will be able to charge uh, uh to charge uh, uh, a good level for for its services while if you are in a, in a business with low uh, per, uh pricing power you will suffer in in a, in a tough environment uh, i think warren buffett says that uh, uh a doctor will always be able to price its services at a good level whatever whatever the context because people you know have to go to the doctor and 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 want to be you know to 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 have a good health whatever the inflation rate whatever you know the 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 gdp growth etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think we have to in a way apply this uh, way of thinking to to the companies that we look at you know is it a company that is really providing value added to its clients or, or not, and um, and if inflation is there, or if recession is there, or whatever, you know, they will be able to navigate this environment. Uh, if there are taxes in the U.S., uh, uh, well, if the service is absolutely great, well, the clients and there's no alternative, then the clients will pay your premium, will pay the taxes, you know, the the custom duties to to buy the service. Um, but uh, yeah, and then it's on a case by case basis. Uh, it's uh you know there are some areas where it's trickier than others but uh... okay so mariano says uh, i thought that monte piet was not listening since the its acquisitions by limanal but do you mean the same company yeah yeah it's the same yeah so we acquired it in 2013 and it was taken over in 2016 if my uh, memory is good so now it's not listed anymore yeah Okay, and um, uh, how many percent in Sextan PMEA will you consider as growth companies and how many as value? Uh, the volume of the fund, uh, it was at 195 million right now. From uh, which value would you say that you cannot invest in the small caps and growth anymore? And you are the forced to invest in value as a Warren Buffett current philosophy? Okay, uh, great questions. Um, we don't uh, we don't um, qualify our holdings based on growth or non-growth. Uh, we just assume we just we have 
conservative assumptions in terms of growth. That's what I would say. Uh, some companies are currently growing at 20% per annum uh, and have completely outperformed what we were thinking. Some have just zero growth, uh, but are very cheap. Uh, so, you know, I would I would still say that, you know, 90%, probably or 80 to 90% of the portfolio is in a growing mode, right? But we, we are not looking for growth per se. Uh, we are looking at a combination of, of growth and, you know, and, and price, but quality is even more important. Um, you know, for example, we have a, we have a stake in a, in a agriculture equipment company uh, called Excel, uh, E-X-E-L. Uh, it's a company that uh, currently has zero growth uh, because the, the agriculture market is not uh, very favorable right now. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, when um, uh, grain prices uh, recover, uh, maybe they will have a 20% growth. So I mean, it's a great company, great business. They, you know, they have the capacity to gain market share. Uh, the market is obsessed with the current very little growth or even slight decline. But we feel that when the, the environment will be a bit more favorable, they will benefit. Okay. So so we don't really look at it uh, this way, but for sure, a business, you know, that is losing market share structurally is very risky, okay? So even if, if, even if it's growing, but it's growing less than the peers, it means that it's, it's a company that is in danger, okay? While if it's just declining because the market is a bit uh, tough, it's not such a bad situation. You see what I mean? Um, there was a question, yeah, on uh, Sextant PME. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, the fund, um, actually, the fund is currently half closed. Uh, so you cannot invest in, uh, unfortunately, uh, because we have closed it last year uh, for new subscriptions at uh, 250 million euros. Uh, we clearly said that uh, uh, it was... Uh, it was not the maximum, but it was it was becoming, and especially last year, we had lots of inflows at the beginning of the year in this fund. And really, really for us, the priority is the, to preserving the track record of this fund. So we didn't want to rush and buy uh, any kind of uh, any kind of stock. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it becomes tricky because you want to to lower your 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 position in a given stock, but you have lots of inflows, so you are basically keeping the the position and and are just getting diluted, but it gets a bit uncomfortable. Um, so we have said that we would start, uh, we, we would reopen the fund at 175 million. Uh, so the good thing with the fund that is half closed is that you only have redemptions because you don't have uh, inflows. Uh, so so uh, even if the, the performance has been positive uh, since we closed, it, you know, it's getting closer to the to the 175, so we should be able to uh, to reopen it, uh, maybe this year. You know, depending on on the market uh, conditions. And there was a third question that I forgot. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now we have a, a a lot of more questions. If you want, we okay, can okay. just pass because if not, we okay. Uh, one more is. Um, one of the main problems of the small caps funds is the liquidity of the companies that they buy. And um, how mm -hmm. do you solve this problem? Yeah, um, so we just see it's a it's a it's a problem and 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 uh, a problem to be aware of because lack of liquidity can create um, volatility. Okay, when things are good, like they have been in the last few years. Actually, lack of liquidity can even lower volatility because, you know, traders uh, who trade, you know, based on you know any kind of economic in this, they don't do, they don't look at small caps. Okay, so, but this when there is a, a, a liquidity issue uh, and everybody's scared and wants to get out, uh, that's when volatility increases. The problem, as I provocatively say sometimes, is that is not to have a stock that drops 75%. The problem is 
if it drops 75% and does not rebound, okay? Or the problem is if you drop 75% and you sell, you know, uh, and then it recovers. So that's why it creates, you know, you have both, you know, the first problem, I mean, you deal with it by investing in quality stocks. It's to avoiding to buy, uh, to buy companies that may look cheap in a very favorable environment, like 2007, you invest in something that looks cheap on a P uh, approach, but the quality of the business is very low. And then when you have an economic recession that is severe, the company does not make any profit anymore. So then it becomes obviously expensive at any price. So you deal with it this way. And and the psychology impact, I mean, it's, it's, it's the problem either of the in, end investor, if it goes directly, or if it's advisors, uh, and it's the one that is the most uh, the most tricky, and that's also why we have a wealth management actually approach in house, uh, when uh, where 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 high net worth individuals, because obviously it's only for big uh, uh, big accounts because it takes a lot of manpower. Uh, you know, investors can talk directly to to the team, um, um, but uh, uh, you have to be aware of it. Uh, we have small, I mean. So we have small cap funds, and we have to accept that liquidity has to be low at some times. Uh, we we uh, we don't have super big positions, uh, or big positions tend to be five percent uh, of the of the portfolio. We have many positions between four and five percent, basically, uh, and we also have some cash in the portfolio. Uh, but it's a risk that has to be really, really, really thought about by end investors. Uh, liquidity, as you said, is um, is the big thing to to, to remember, uh, and it can create volatility in some uh, bad episodes. But that's also when it's a good opportunity to buy, obviously. Yeah? So so uh, uh, for 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 people who are less at ease with this kind of volatility and may fear that. Psychologically, it would be tough uh, to keep the position in such a bad scenario. Uh, there are funds that have uh, that are more flexible that can uh, invest. Uh, like we have, for example, Sextant Grand Large, uh, which uh, uh, has the capacity to drop exposure to equities to zero. For example, uh, currently it's at 30 uh, percent. Uh, we have funds with uh, you know a mix of uh, uh, small and mid caps. Actually, Sextant PEA or historic fund currently has more mid and large caps than small caps so i think it's also depending on the typology of the of the of the investors okay in uh in what geographical areas do you find more value in what theoretical areas geographical uh, geographical okay yeah um uh, interesting questions so currently um in Europe, um, I would still say that Greece is a great place to look at um, because the economic recovery has still not happened. Uh, it's still, well, investors are slowly coming back to Greece. Uh, and, and comp you know, when I was traveling to Greece uh, three years ago, the companies were telling me that they were not doing any roadshow anymore because people didn't want to talk to them or people who were talking to them were just talking about macroeconomics and not about what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, you know, they are traveling much more, and Goldman Sachs has a Greek conference now, for example. But still, uh, it's a great place to look at. Uh, actually, there's been a convergence of valuations in the small cap segment. Uh, three, four years ago, basically, South Europe was cheap, and Northern Europe was expensive. The UK market was the most expensive market uh, in Europe uh, in early 16. With the Brexit, uh, it, this premium has disappeared. Uh, the French market was trading at a discount. Now, you know, with, uh, you know, Macron and uh, a more positive economic climate, you know, same, this uh, French discount has disappeared. So um, there's been a convergence. The, the Italian market, the Spanish market have done very well also. Um, so, uh, so there would be, you know, mostly Greece right now, um, but you you also have to to look at the uh, at the quality and Scandinavia is a great place because you have great companies that uh, that trade at similar 
valuations than uh, uh, countries that are in uh, structurally uh, more tricky situations, you know, in terms of public finances at least. So, you know, that's maybe that's where we, we look, we find more ideas would be Greece and Scandinavia. Related with this one, and uh, uh, in the U.S. stock markets, do you think is the is overvalued, or uh, or they are they still margin for growth? Yeah, well, the, uh, we have um, we have a team uh, uh, that is uh, really looking at any type of uh, region. So we have one analyst covering the U.S. Um, Clearly, it's a place where we invest uh, very little. Actually, we have a stake in Berkshire Hathaway, and that's about it. Uh, the market is super expensive, um, and we, but we've said that for a long time, so <laughs> uh, clearly don't follow our call. Uh, you know, if we look at any type of long-term indicator, it's at uh, record highs. So. We, we look at the Schiller P multiple, for example. So it's a it's a P that looks at earnings on the, of the last 10 years and not of the current year. Uh, and it's a good leading indicator for the performance of the market in the future years. Actually, Robert Schiller got the Nobel Prize in 2013 for this. And it's at record highs. So it's at a similar level to 2000 or 2007, for example. Um, so 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 yeah, we think we think the the, the U.S. market is overvalued. Uh, what's difficult is that the European market is not you know it's a bit above average, like maybe 20% above uh, its historical average. But with the current uh, interest rate uh, situation, it's not that absurd. Uh, that's why we prefer Europe. Uh, but obviously, the U.S. market is a leading market. If there is a crash in the U.S., the other markets will be impacted. So. Uh, so tricky to say. Uh, clearly, we don't find uh, we don't find uh, interesting ideas in the U.S., uh, but it's been the case for for some time now. And also related with this one, uh, how do you consider the Brexit factor during the analysis of British companies based on the current price, as a risk factor or as a risk as a company or, or uh, as an opportunity? I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, well, basically, in the past, we were uh, the UK market was not our priority in terms of looking for ideas because it was trading at a premium, and also uh, there's a lot of competition to look at uh, British names uh, because obviously the asset management industry is very strong in the UK. Uh, however, we've uh, we've now done uh, some significant work on this uh, on this market. Um, Actually, you have two. Um, there is a big dichotomy in the UK market. All the companies that are export-oriented or multinationals and not very much dependent on the on the UK market, they are very expensive. Uh, uh, the market has clearly recognized that uh, you know you have to look at where they are making the profits and not just where they are listed. Um, so the market is rather efficient in this way. And the cyclical domestic stocks have been hammered. Uh, so in the construction industry, for example, or, uh, it's, been, it's been very tricky. So it's a little bit where we are, we are looking at. Uh, we haven't found, to be honest, the very convincing ideas there. Um, very often because of the quality of the business or the quality of the management. But we are... Uh, we are still uh, hopeful, but still in this journey, we, we find some uh, some ideas that are that are uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, even you know they even if they are not UK, you know domestic UK uh, linked. So so yeah, I mean obviously the UK is, is very different to compare to Greece. You know Greece. Uh, was completely hammered. Whatever the activity or the geographic presence of uh, of the companies, uh, while the UK uh, the UK asset management industry is much uh, much stronger, much more efficient. So it has the capacity to 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 to, to differentiate. But we are still hopeful to to find uh, interesting ideas. 
I think the Brexit story will be, you know, there is a Brexit risk, but there is also the Corbyn risk. Actually, it's uh, it's maybe what uh, uh, is a more uh, is a bigger risk than the Brexit. I mean, the Brexit in itself, as long as the the UK uh, uh, governors are, you know, capitalists, uh, they will be always uh, pro business. But if tomorrow you have uh, somebody like uh, Corbyn, uh, who is uh, uh, a bit uh, like or Mélenchon, or like uh, you know, every party, right? Now, every every country has their own populists. Uh, you know, if, if the UK becomes becomes socialist, uh, that's another another story. So this is the kind of risk that you have to to incorporate also when you're thinking. Um, but yeah, we're looking. And finally, because we don't have more time. Could you explain the process of uh, how it was the creation of the new office in Singapore and what results are you given? Okay, yeah, so uh, Singapore, uh, I mean, since I joined in 2008, it has al always been a dream uh, for the team to, to, to have an office in Singapore. Hong Kong was also contemplated. Um, and um, our founder, Francois Badlon, who was actually... Uh, uh, previously uh, uh, living in Spain, uh, decided to go there with his family to uh, to launch this uh, this project and uh, reinforce our uh, Asian expertise. Uh, so we use this Asian expertise in uh, in many of our funds. Uh, but first, our Auto du Monde fund, uh, which is really the around the world uh, uh, equity portfolio. Uh, also in Grand Large, huh, which is a flexible uh, global portfolio. Uh, the idea is really to get close uh, uh, to to, uh, to the, the management and the business uh, in Asia. We are hiring for this locals, uh, local individuals. So uh, the equity research team is head by uh, Sid Choraria, who, uh, who had been actually is an Indian, uh, I mean, educated in the States. Um, who uh, was uh, already living in Singapore uh, for a few years. Um, he has hired uh, so far uh, one Singaporean uh, and uh, two Chinese, I mean, one Chinese, pure Chinese, and one French Chinese. Um, so, so right now it's a team of four people plus uh, Francois Badlon, uh, and they are traveling all over Asia. Uh, we also have Jacques Goulombard, who, 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 was a, who was a French guy who was in the Paris office, but just moved to Singapore. He, he follows Korean stocks. We don't have any Korean analysts right now. If you, if you, if you know anybody, don't hesitate. Uh, and um, the, yeah, the idea is really, is really this. Uh, uh, for now, we don't have a project to launch an Asian fund, but you know, maybe you know, never say never. Uh, the real purpose right now is to, to find as many IDs that the communication between the two offices remains strong. Uh, we we spent some time also on this to have everybody on the same page uh, and, and really share the same philosophy. Uh, that That's the project and, uh, and it's quite exciting. So uh, we have great people there. Um, so um, So we are quite hopeful for the future, yeah. But it's not supposed to be, let's say, a profit center in the short term. Uh, so it's not really uh, the purpose is not to launch commercial activity there. It might come someday, uh, but we'll see. Uh, the idea is really to uh, to invest in the team. We are also expanding the team uh, following Europe uh, in Paris, uh, looking for uh, for like-minded investors. Uh, so it's always been the the case. At Samira, we've always decided to. Uh, to be uh, ahead of the asset under management, uh, just in case that tomorrow we we manage more, we must be ready to to be able to continue to deliver uh, a good performance to to our investors. So that's really the philosophy and, and why we opened Singapore. And uh, <clears throat> so thank you so much, Mr. Moreau, and. Gracias a todos los asistentes. Um, we look forward to see you for the upcoming events like this one. That will be a pleasure. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you, Samuel. And if you have questions, I think you you have the emails uh, of uh, of the uh, of our people in charge of uh, uh, investor relations in Spain. So Pablo and Francisco. 
uh, I just showed the uh, the last slide so that you can uh, you can take their, their contact if you need anything. <clears throat> okay, so thank you so much. See thank you. you very much. Bye bye. bye.